This video is brought to you by the generous support of my patrons on Patreon. If you wish to support the channel and allow me to dedicate more time to producing such videos, you can do so with a small monthly donation on patreon.com slash Balkan Odyssey. The ideas of Marxism are often regarded as being naive and utopian. The people who pursue its conclusions are seen as juvenile idiots who don't seem to grasp the harsh truths of the real world, caught up in a hopeless dream, trying to impose their utopian ideas onto the world. Pleas for radical change are regarded as infantile impulses, led by nothing but emotions and a hollow sense of justice and hypermoralization. We've all heard it. If you're not a socialist before you're 25, you have no heart. But if you're a socialist after 25, you have no head. This is the most prevalent form in which these statements take shape and reflect the deep lack of understanding and engagement with actual political matter and theory, ironically reducing politics to impulsive cheerleading, where your sacred opinion on surface-level cultural non-issues conveniently labels you a conservative or a liberal, with nothing acceptable in between or beyond. Nonetheless, this video essay will offer a concrete answer to the accusation that socialism is utopian, in a systematic, pragmatic manner. In order to do that, we must engage with the historical development and transformation of the concept of socialism, its inception, theoretical expansion, and practical implementation throughout the centuries. For socialism is not a static, eternal, fixed concept, but rather an idea that has evolved in the heads and works of numerous intellectuals and which has, through the contributions of Marx and Engels, matured into a positive science, grounded in authentic material realities, observable and quantifiable through the scientific analysis of material conditions of human societies throughout history. Now, in order to understand this evolution and the contemporary maturity and scientific validity of this concept, we must start our journey with its embryonic form of the 19th century, utopian socialism, whose initial ideas were coined and exemplified by the likes of Henri de Saint-Simon, Charles Fourier, and Robert Owen, also known as the Three Great Utopians. In its theoretical form, modern socialism originally appears ostensibly as a more logical extension of the principles laid down by the French philosophers of the 18th century. Like every new theory, Modern socialism had, at first, to connect itself with the intellectual stock and trade ready to its hand, however deeply its roots may lay in economic facts. Namely, it was primarily British and French thinkers of the 19th century who embarked upon the task of social criticism, based purely on idealist notions of justice, which produced a vast array of doctrines and social experiments that manifested themselves in novel perceptions and visions about imaginary, futuristic, ideal societies, disconnected from the actual material reality of that time. These endeavors can be seen as attempts of dogmatically imposing imaginary and ideal conceptions of a just and harmonious society onto the real world, which is, ironically enough, the main quote-unquote argument of contemporary critics against Marxism, which has based its conceptual apparatus on the ruthless criticism of these initially utopian ideas. Utopian socialism of the 19th century was therefore an initial, infantile stage, which is unavoidable and necessary for the development of any idea, no matter its hardcore scientific maturity. In regards to the authors of these ideas, Engels had the following to say. As a matter of fact, every concept of the universe is subject to the objective limitations owing to the conditions of historical knowledge, and subjectively, in addition owing to the physical and mental makeup of the author of the concept. The great thinkers of the 18th century could, no more than their predecessors, go beyond the limits imposed upon them by their epoch. For example, in physics, Atoms, the fundamental building blocks of our universe, were first conceptualized in a vast array of seemingly silly ideas, grounded in metaphysical concepts of the human imagination. John Dalton's atomic model, the Plum Pudding model, Rutherford's model, and Bohr's model, among others, were the necessary stages which paved the path for our current understanding of particle physics, culminating in the quantum mechanics model of the atom of modern science. Besides, 
The shape and size of the Earth, as well as its relations to other heavenly bodies, has undergone a plethora of changes in its different imaginative interpretations, which has helped mature our current heliocentric model, which is ultimately rooted in the best scientific facts we currently have at our disposal. This progression of scientific understanding in all fields, including astronomy, has been subject to fierce opposition by reactionary conservative forces, such as the Catholic Church during the time of Copernicus, and flat earthers and ultimately anti-communists in the modern day and age, who all seek to protect their established positions of power through deceitful and manipulative means. Whether it be old-fashioned witch hunts of the Middle Ages, or the Red Scare and McCarthyism of the Cold War. While describing this evolutionary path of socialism, Engels had the following to say in Anti During. In the meantime, along with and after the French philosophy of the 18th century, had arisen the new German philosophy, culminating in Hegel. Its greatest merit was the taking up again of dialectics as the highest form of reasoning. The analysis of nature into its individual parts, the regrouping of different natural processes and objects in definite classes, the study of the internal anatomy of organic bodies in their manifold forms, these were the fundamental conditions of the gigantic strides in our knowledge of nature that have been made during the last 400 years. But this method of work has also left us as legacy, the habit of observing natural objects and processes in isolation, apart from their connection with the vast whole, of observing them in repose, not in motion, as constants, not as essentially variables, in their death, not in their life. And when this way of looking at things was transferred by Bacon and Locke from natural science to philosophy, it constituted the especially narrow metaphysical mode of thought, peculiar to the preceding centuries. To the metaphysician, Things and their mental reflexes, ideas, are isolated, are to be considered one after the other and apart from each other, are objects of investigation fixed, rigid, given once for all. At first sight, this mode of thinking seems to us very luminous, because it is that of so-called sound common sense. Only sound common sense, respectable fellow that he is in the homely realm of his own four walls, has very wonderful adventures directly he ventures out into the wide world of research. And the metaphysical mode of thought, justifiable and even necessary as it is in a number of domains, whose extent varies according to the nature of the particular object of investigation, sooner or later reaches a limit, beyond which it becomes one-sided, restricted, abstract, lost in insoluble contradictions. In the contemplation of individual things, it forgets the connection between them. In the contemplation of their existence, it forgets the beginning and end of that existence. Of their repose, it forgets their motion. It cannot see the wood for the trees. On the further development of the dialectic, Engels continues. This later German philosophy found its conclusion in the philosophy of Hegel, where, for the first time, and this is his greatest service, the entire natural, historical, and spiritual universe was regarded as a process, that is, as in constant progress, change, transformation, and development, and the attempt was made to show the more subtle relations of this process and development. When we consider and reflect upon nature at large, or the history of mankind, or our own intellectual activity, at first, we see the picture of an endless entanglement of relations and reactions, in which nothing remains what, where, and as it was, but everything moves, changes, comes into being, and passes away. This primitive, naive, but intrinsically correct conception of the world is that of ancient Greek philosophy, and was first clearly formulated by Heraclitus. Everything is and is not, for everything is fluid, is constantly changing, constantly coming into being, and passing away. Though Hegel, like Saint-Simon, was the most universal intellect of his time, he was still limited, in the first place, through the necessarily narrow grasp of his own knowledge, and in addition, through the limitations of the contemporary conditions of knowledge. Hegel was an idealist, that is, he regarded thought 
not as a mere abstract representation of real phenomena, but on the contrary. Phenomena and their development appear to him as the representations of the idea which existed before the world. The result was an inversion of everything. The actual interrelations of the universe were turned completely upside down. The total perversion of modern German idealism of necessity drove men to materialism, but not, and this is well worth noting, to mere metaphysical, mechanical materialism of the 18th century. The new facts, moreover, rendered necessary a new investigation of all preceding history, and then it became evident that all history up to then had been a history of class struggles, and that these mutually conflicting classes are the results of a given method of production and distribution at a given period, and, in a word, of the economic conditions of that epoch. Hence, that the economic structure of society at a given time furnishes the real foundation upon which the entire superstructure of political and juristic institutions, as well as the religious, philosophical, and other abstract notions of a given period, are to be explained in the last instance. Idealism was thereupon driven from its last refuge, the philosophy of history. A materialistic philosophy of history was set up, and the path was discovered by which the consciousness of man could be shown as springing from his existence, rather than his existence from his consciousness. As Engels explains in a different paragraph of Anti Döring, if we derive the scheme of the universe not from our own brain, but merely by means of our own brain, from the material world, we need no philosophy, but simply knowledge of the world and what occurs in it. And the results of this knowledge likewise do not constitute a philosophy, but positive science. This is the deciding moment at which Marxism has matured into the conceptual apparatus for observing human societies and history. The steady introduction of the dialectic through Hegel and materialism through Marx ultimately molded these two conceptual objects into the scientific method for observing history dialectical and ultimately historical materialism, which helped to demystify the origins, inner workings, and future prospects of capital. For these two great discoveries, the materialistic conception of history and the disclosure of the mystery of capitalistic production, we must thank Marx. Granted these, socialism became a science, which thereupon had to busy itself in the working out of these ideas in their individual aspects and connections. This new socialism, for the first time grounded in objective facts through the contributions of Marx, is fundamentally different from its juvenile predecessor of the 18th century, which is still up to this day used as a straw man against modern socialism and is still considered to be all there is to this supposedly naive, childish, utopian socialist ideal. I guess it is just easier to regurgitate and repeat the same catchwords you hear from your favorite dark web pseudo-intellectual who just keeps reaffirming your ingrained biases than to, you know, read a fucking book, the actual words of the people who we arrogantly dismiss and spit on. Because Santa Claus wants to take my toothbrush, oh no. Nonetheless. The ultimate difference between modern, scientific socialism and its utopian counterpart would be the following. The then existing socialism criticized the prevailing capitalistic methods of production and their results, but it could not explain them and thus could not match itself against them. It could only brush them on one side as being bad. But it was necessary to show, on the one hand, the capitalistic methods of production and their historical connection and their necessity at a given epoch, and therefore the necessity of their ultimate disappearance. As to the relentless accusations of utopianism in Marx's works, Lenin had the following to say. There is no trace of utopianism in Marx, in the sense that he made up or invented a quote-unquote new society. No, he studied the birth of the new society out of the old, and the forms of transition from the latter to the former as a mass proletarian movement, and tried to draw practical lessons from it. Furthermore, summing up the scientific basis of Marxism, Lenin wrote the following in his monumental work State and Revolution. 
The whole theory of Marx is the application of the theory of development in its most consistent, complete, considered and pithy form to modern capitalism. Naturally, Marx was faced with the problem of applying this theory both on the forthcoming collapse of capitalism and to the future development of future communism. On the basis of what facts, then, can the question of the future development of future communism be dealt with? On the basis of the fact that it has its origin in capitalism, that it develops historically from capitalism, that it is the result of the action of a social force to which capitalism gave birth. There is no trace of an attempt on Marx's part to make up a utopia, to indulge in idle guesswork about what cannot be known. Marx treated the question of communism in the same way as a naturalist would treat the question of the development of, say, a new biological variety. Once he knew that it had originated in such and such a way and was changing in such and such a definite direction. Besides, the objectively observable development of communism from capitalism, unlike utopian and anarchist dreams, rests on the acknowledgement of the following necessary components. Namely, the first fact that has been established most accurately by the whole theory of development, by science as a whole, a fact that was ignored by the utopians and is ignored by present-day opportunists who are afraid of the socialist revolution is that, historically, there must undoubtedly be a special stage, or a special phase, of transition from capitalism to communism. The question then arises, what transformation will the state undergo in communist society? This question can only be answered scientifically and one does not get a flea-hop nearer to the problem by a thousandfold combination of the word people with the word state. Between capitalist and communist society, there lies the period of the revolutionary transformation of the one into the other. Corresponding to this is also a political transition period, in which the state can be nothing but the revolutionary dictatorship of the proletariat. In his successful popularization of this concept, Lenin had the following to say. Bourgeois states are most varied in form, but their essence is the same. All these states, whatever their form, in the final analysis are inevitably the dictatorship of the bourgeoisie. The transition from capitalism to communism is certainly bound to yield a tremendous abundance and variety of political forms, but the essence will inevitably be the same the dictatorship of the proletariat. During the transition from capitalism to communism, suppression is still necessary, but it is now the suppression of the exploiting minority by the exploited majority. A special apparatus, a special machine for suppression, the quote-unquote state, is still necessary, but this is now a transitional state. The proletariat needs state power, a centralized organization of force, an organization of violence, both to crush the resistance of the exploiters and to lead the enormous mass of the population, the peasants, the petty bourgeoisie and the semi-proletarians, in the work of organizing a socialist economy. In reality, this period inevitably is a period of an unprecedentedly violent class struggle in unprecedentedly acute forms, and consequently, during this period, the state must inevitably be a state that is democratic in a new way, for the proletariat and the propertyless in general, and dictatorial in a new way, against the bourgeoisie. Lenin then continues, Simultaneously with an immense expansion of democracy, which for the first time becomes democracy for the poor, democracy for the people, and not democracy for the money bags, the dictatorship of the proletariat imposes a series of restrictions on the freedom of the oppressors, the exploiters, the capitalists. We must suppress them in order to free humanity from wage slavery. Their resistance must be crushed by force. It is clear that there is no freedom and no democracy where there is suppression and where there is violence. What is usually called socialism was termed by Marx the first or lower phase of communist society. Insofar as the means of production becomes common property, the word communism is also applicable here, providing we do not forget that this is not complete communism. The great significance of Marx's explanations is that here, too, he consistently applies materialist dialectics, the theory of development, and regards communism as something which develops out of capitalism. 
Instead of scholastically invented, concocted definitions and fruitless disputes over words, what is socialism, what is communism, Marx gives an analysis of what might be called the stages of the economic maturity of communism. These very stages are explored in detail in Marx's critique of the Gotha program, and we will tackle them in a separate video. Nonetheless, judging by these quotations from the works of Marx, Engels, and Lenin, one needs only goodwill and intellectual honesty to conclude that there are no signs of utopianism within these passages. Notions of possible freedom and democracy are derived from and subsequently shaped within the confines of the necessities of that historical context. Marxism recognizes the historical necessity of violent struggle, the necessity of a transitional period, the reversal of oppression and the transitory nature of the development of socioeconomic systems. Nothing is black and white, nothing is static, nor is it abolishable and replaceable overnight through a glorious, bloodless, fantastic revolution or magical reform. As Engels poetically expressed in anti During, freedom does not consist in an imaginary independence of natural laws, but in a knowledge of these laws, and in the possibility thence derived of applying them intelligently to given ends. Marxists do not promise a utopia of equality over abundance and freedom, or any similar empty, meaningless phrase based on personal notions of justice, morals, and ethics. We recognize the ugly necessity of struggle and the disappointing burden of time and scale, but also the limitations of our own knowledge. As a matter of fact, also every concept of the universe is subject to objective limitations owing to the conditions of historical knowledge, and subjectively, in addition, owing to the physical and mental makeup of the author of the concept. To all appearances, we are just standing at the threshold of human history, and the generations which will correct us will be much more numerous than those whose knowledge, often with little enough regard, we ourselves correct. Moreover, we are not at all alarmed, because the step of science upon which we today stand is not a bit more final than any of the preceding steps. Marxism, the transitory stage of socialism, the dictatorship of the proletariat, and the conclusion of communism are all based on scientific observation of all preceding history, the peculiarities of the current capitalist mode of production, and the inevitability of its collapse owing to the irreconcilability of its inner contradictions, are all objectively and materially expressed in the class struggle and social revolutions across the ages, which embody and manifest this very inevitable motion and development of everything in the universe. Nothing is eternal, static, or unchangeable. Not slavery, feudalism, or capitalism. Each epoch carries within itself the seeds of its own dissolution. Now it's up to the coming generations to take matters into their own hands and aid capitalism, imperialism, class differences, subjugation, exploitation, and its ultimate embodiment, the state machinery, to where they will then belong, into a museum of antiquities, by the side of the spinning wheel and the bronze axe.